The Steel Empire, aka Kotetsu Teikoku for the Sega Genesis, by the combined efforts of the ill-fated Flying Edge Care of Acclaim and Hot B, aka Starfish SD Today, circa 1992. And yes, I'm dedicating this to the entire Steve Punk community. As usual, for the sake of speeding things up for this finale, I'm taking this opportunity to acknowledge the following. Brooklyn Interactive Group, Somerville Media Center, Ian Bergeson, Matt Lester, and The Stones, from Merrimack, Dover, and Ridge, New Hampshire, respectively. Blast Processing Video Games, Boston Open Screen, The Mount Vernon Kid, Java Slovakia, Blast from SHD, Film and Stuff, Riding Sky 100, Manta Ray Vasquez, formerly The Lava Buster, of Zeratopolis fame, Kenzie Bach, Lauren Prespisa, Rod Weber, Embry Galen, Bitbar, and the other Coming Crypt in Salem, James Rolfe, Kieran and Company from Cinema Massacre, Mike Bate, and finally Pam from Cannot Be Tamed, and Girls Play from Oregon. Anyhow, with all that out of the way, on to our main premise. A military coup d'etat has occurred in the world's largest city, Dama, and a power-hungry dictator, industrialist, and robber baron by the name of General Styron rules by brute force and military might with its goliath-like defenses sporting near-impenetrable armor-piercing missiles and lethal aerial mines, putting even the likes of Smash Daisaku from Gunstar Heroes and Gerard Donner from Venus Wars to absolute motherfucking shame. With none strong enough to stand up against his dominant ass, Styron sets his vision of steel and steam on the whole motherfucking planet. His titular Steel Empire, hence the Motorhead Empire, are commonly known as Motorheads by their subjects and enemies alike, due to its blue-gray, steel, mustachioed, colossal head emblem, which at times emits steam. Located far from the reach of Styron's Steel Empire, centered in Antarctica, and where some of the greatest minds in the world have fled from Styron's horseshit-ass tyranny, the Republic of Silverhead is impressively ahead of its time in technology, however. Whereas their rivals, hence those aforementioned motorhead asswipes of the Steel Empire, still rely on steam power, dynamite, and coal burning with almost religious zeal. And as if even that didn't shake the goddamn apple cart enough, Silverhead has at least perfected sustainable energy, geothermal energy, and even cold fusion amongst its most documented breakthroughs. However, if the wider world were to also harness the power of lightning in the atom, it could pose a rather unexpected and shocking threat, no pun intended I assure everyone, to Styron's coal and steam based status quo, thus all quote unquote abominations of nature the dictator would see come to an untimely end. The Republic of Silverhead possesses a small yet elite air force, whose symbol is a silver eagle with a star between its wings. Although dwarfed in number by the endless legions of Motorhead, the Silverheads are still renowned for both the earlier recounted advanced technology of their aircrafts and the aerial skill of their pilots. The Republic's Air Force is also equipped with the Imamio Thunder, known to Silverhead's enemies as the Lightning Bomb, which is more fucking powerful than anything in Motorhead's arsenal. Thusly, Silverhead's considered to be the last hope for freedom, and they alone have the will and the weapons to bring about Motorhead's inevitable downfall. Amongst that elite air force is a lone, highly trained pilot with access to one of its two aerial crafts, a badass striker biplane and a mammoth-like Zeppelin airship, codenamed Z-01. As far as gameplay, think you know intense shoot 'em ups like this? Wake up and taste the three-layer blueberry upside-down pancakes topped with cinnamon, ghost pepper, and Sadie Holmes and Angelina Jolie's own breast milk. As mentioned during the premise, you're in command of either a Stryker or Z-01 Zeppelin aircraft, sanctioned by Silverhead, with the former traveling much faster than the latter, despite its possession of more destructive firepower and vitality by comparison. Soaring through enemy territory, and eradicating every opposing legion of Motorhead aircraft, vehicles, and various WMDs, while reclaiming all of the enslaved civilizations under the control of that unscrupulous as shit empire. Control-wise, the D-pad forces your fighter plane and or Zeppelin airship to travel of its free will anywhere, and by default, considering the commands of the next three buttons can be shifted beforehand at the options menu, cause the goddamn Genesis, A unleashes the lightning bomb, thereby not only making short work of every incoming massive enemy fleet, but the colossal and towering bosses you'll confront, if in some cases not by much concerning the latter, while BMC beckon the main gunfire and minor bomb deployment of your desired aircraft to the left and right respectively. 
Regardless of which aircraft you're helming, under no circumstances are you to expose either of them to any opposing projectile fire or unexpected collisions with landscapes and or enemy aircraft whatsoever, whether minor or vast. Hence those aforementioned varying vitality meters above, or they'll end up being savagely fucking totaled worse than that giant yellow Ultima Ratio blimp from Pat Labor 2 and the sole laser satellite from Akira combined. In terms of the assorted item medallions you'll find yourself in constant need of upon neutralizing either a single cargo plane or row of cargo planes, there's your experience items for enhancing the shit out of your aircraft's overall firepower and minor explosive supplies, in conjunction with its speed and overall vitality, three of which must be acquired to reach the next level and every single one thereafter, with the max being 20 upon acquiring 60 in a row, cause once again, basic fucking math. Hearts for refilling its energy, options for summoning a pair of diminutive drones for added firepower, and take note, they're lost instantly upon your biplane or airship being crushed the fuck. Speed boosters for upping the ante on your aircraft's traveling capabilities, extra lightning bombs in case you need another for even the more mind-numbing confrontations, and even extra blue moon rare one-ups. Once again, guess what the Christ they do? As for the overall itinerary of operations to once and for all bring those menacing, pissant motorhead motherfuckers to their goddamn knees, you're cruising through the mine city of Raw, guarded by both a Type 2 Sky Clipper and a Colossus Cannon Train, armed to the gills with volleys of propeller bombs and rockets, volleys of giant cannonballs, gun turrets, and multi barrel spray pattern air bombs within the underground leading gale caverns, complete with more than just a shitload of boulders and hazardous explosive gases that emanate from the ground should any spark go off. There's also two gargantuan as fuck tanks to pursue and demolish the ever-growing Christ out of, the illuminating tunnel tank and the often isolating mole tank, in between whose confrontations a high-speed frenzy fight ensues, reminiscent of Milton Bradley and Atsume's Abadox, Konami's Gradius 2 and Beyond, Life Force, and even Rare's Battletoads the cloud-covered Sky District Zector, conquered by both a massive-ass floating fortress and a Class 1 Arrow gunship, surrounded by legion after legion of more aerial attackers that put Project 4 from UN Squadron to the most irreversible contempt beyond one's own figment of imagination, at Gardani Beach outside Dama, ruled by two amphibious airships, the Sea Skimmer, complete with more than just fins, no less. Obviously, both a scattering volley of propeller bombs and trumpet guns, and the Navy Air Submarine, notorious for attacking two ways, unleashing five missiles while submerged, and deploying its recessed guns and front-firing rockets while airborne. Above the night skies of Dama City, ruled vigorously by both Arrow gunships, classes 2 and 3, and their often opposing legions, while a neighboring fortress gets told to shit at the beginning. A sunrise-illuminated desert away from Dama, featuring a golden variation of the very same Colossus cannon train, except with a bouncing burgundy bomb, followed by the near impenetrable as fuck underground Gerburn fortress, beneath which the sea skimmers lie and various other airships you've faced off against so far. And finally into lunar space, high above our big blue earth no less, during which the long-awaited final confrontation ensues against General Styron's trio of magenta lunar knot ships, equipped with every motherfucking weapon we've seen so far, and his end-all be-all undisputed personal leading airship, the Emperor Scout, not only equipped with about the same, but also a secret, near inescapable attack, which I imagine many have found a way to evade by now, likewise for yours truly, about which, no rhyme intended, I'll elaborate momentarily. Bottom line, and who could have guessed or expected otherwise, this is where our next usual subject comes in. They'll do way more than lure you into one living fucking nightmare after another, with each becoming harder and harder to snap back from than the last, unless you're well aware of what lies ahead, or floods ahead in this case, and are completely armed and enhanced in preparation for them. Do I even need to remind everyone how straightforward and immaculate the controls are, minus any delays or bugs whatsoever, let alone how undeniably tolerable and on the up and up the gameplay framework is for shit's sake? In regards to Steel Empire's challenge, considering how much of a walk in the park this game is, according to many fucking sources no less, and just so everyone's fully aware, under no circumstances do I intend any debates or downplaying whatsoever. There's also no denying that it'll deep fry your brains, saute them in Tabasco sauce, and serve them to the zombies next door. As I've been advising time and time again with every shmup I've covered so far, only stalwart patience, undivided concentration, expert timing, and top-notch first-ring reflexes are the key pillars to every well-deserved victory, in conjunction with those often handy item medallions. In addition to everything else, however, remember that final lunar space confrontation against the Lunar Knot triplets, followed by Styron's Emperor Scout I alluded to earlier? The only way to survive the last few moments of that latter indicated cosmic clash for the record is to take cover behind the giant moonlight craters while the Emperor Scout unleashes one randomized volley after another of towering flame pillars. Keep firing away at both the incinerator cannons and the main ship. Wash, rinse, and repeat until it's long awaited demise. And before I go any further, stick with the striker biplane instead of the zeppelin, since the space around the flame pillars when they hit every crater is too goddamn narrow for the ladder to take cover anyway, as it'll result in some slight and unexpected, if often punishing, damage. 
in true Atomic Robo Kid and Turtles 4 Turtles in Time fashion, depending on which difficulty mode you kick things off with, you'll start off with 5 ships and 2 continues on easy, 4 ships and 3 continues on normal, and even 3 ships and 4 continues on hard, individually. By this juncture, every helpful, anti-bullshit statement of advice should be instantly hardwired into your cerebral reaches. Since there's no way down the goddamn cliff that Henry fell from at the end of The Good Son, I'm ever reiterating any of them! On the graphical forefront, just expressing plainly, if firmly, how wondrous and awe-inspiring the presentation is from start to finish, would be considered another in the fucking series of end-all, be-all understatements of the decade. Notwithstanding how great the chances are that seizures can and will occur, hence one of my two crucial warnings, the opening demo, and even the mission briefing, aircraft takeoff, and landing sequences from areas 1 through 6 contain this sort of cinematic, 60-frame film strip style flickering strobe effect, evoking something of a vintage theater vibe. You're best off looking away every once in a while, though in my case, nothing personal, I'm extremely immune to them, except for the more urgent in-game intervals. Everything else, not only the two main Silverhead aircraft you helm, let alone the never-ending opposing Motorhead onslaughts, but also the varying backdrops and scenic environments throughout which their excessive-ass conflicts and perilous pursuits take place, is out of fucking sight and mesmerizing, even going so far as to evoke a serious, early 20th century steampunk vibe, unlike anything the world's ever experienced. And in very unnecessary bluntness, I don't mean any of that futuristic space shit like god knows how many shmups out there, considering the last stage takes place in space, and that this hails from the same year as Lightning Force, aka Thunder Force 4, Biohazard Battle, Soul Deast, Atelier, Space Mega Force, Phalanx, Strike Gunner STG, Riding Trad, Firepower 2000, and even Imperium to name several. It should also be worth noting, in addition, that there's some slight slowdown intervals, unlike, uh, I don't know, every Genesis game out there, hence that whole blast processing trend at the time, mainly during every intense in-game struggle involving armada after armada of standard or massive Motorhead Empire fuckle attackers, not to mention when attempting to eradicate the towering gunships and fortresses searching tirelessly for their ultimate weak points. I mean, seriously, why the hell rebel on any further like an erased-ass mafia boss with a failing ulcer? Come on, forget about it! Pass me the cup of cola! Music and sound-wise, orchestrated by Isao Misoguchi, Yoshiaki Kubotera, and Noriyuki Iwadari, pre-Ranger X, also of Lunar 2 and Grandia fame, and the sound engineer for Power Rangers the movie on Game Boy, all on behalf of Cube Company Limited, I might add, the very selection of tracks are nothing short of unbeatable and far too kick-ass. Seriously, every appropriate track evokes all sorts of thematic dispositions, whether patriotic and encouraging, impassive, eerie, or just all-around fierce and over-the-top. And as prime examples, take note of my top 10 songs displayed here, with some honorable mentions included at the bottom. In addition, the sound effects are in mixed bag territory, but nothing too annoying, especially those much deserved moments when each and every end boss gets demolished to absolute shit fucking all. And let's not get ourselves started about the Digitite's voice samples. Good luck. Also, who could forget that ignition countdown at the start of the seventh and final mission before your ship pursues Tharon all the way to the cosmos? Three, two, one, zero. Replayability-wise, there's very little to express at this point, other than the staggering heights of exhilaration and ecstasy this, yet another overlooked 16-bit title from nearly three decades ago, has to provide and then some. From the unbelievably stellar gameplay mechanics, and the contrasting strategic approaches depending on your desired airship and in between each area, to the nostalgically inspired presentation and modernized bitchin' as fuck soundtrack, not to mention the open windows of opportunity to brush up on your expertise aspects time and time again, and how greatly the pros outweigh the Christ out of the obvious yet minor cons. Anyhow, consider your existence beyond incomplete and meaningless without Flying Edge and Hot Beast's unparalleled Steel Empire. What's my final verdict? Make as much of this if you will, but I've made my points direct yet plain regarding this underrated ass shmup, which I'm in no position to reiterate. 
Did I somehow forget to mention that there's both a Europe-only Game Boy Advance port, but it also launched into the funk Zoo Digital Publishing, aka Zushi Games, and a globally released 3DS port by Taeon, neither of which topped the Genesis original by six times the length of Jonah Falcon's boner? Ignore those and stick with that instead. Hence yet another reason why, as that old unforgettable slogan goes, Genesis does what Nintendo don't. Until then, consider what a hard ass season it's been for the last year and a half. Many thanks for watching, listening, and tuning in, and be sure to look out for my season 7 premiere trailer coming up next week. This is the one and only Hardcore Retro Guide once again proudly signing off. Enough bullshit. Yeah, that's right! Kiss my ass, Motorhead! Fuck right off! <laughs>